This is the Tabernacle Podcast, and I am with the John Williams, Martin Rizzi, our producer, not even in part, in full today, is Matthew Hughes, and I'm Adam Ray. We're looking forward to today to talking about a very uh, prevalent topic, a topic that is often discussed in baptism, mm. and we want to kind of kick off today with a little bit of a different angle. I'd love to hear the Martin Rizzi baptism story, and uh, John Williams would love to hear your story as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we discuss this today, uh, we're looking forward here in just a couple of weeks to baptism across our three campuses in August. And maybe you're listening today, you're not sure exactly what God's called you to as it relates to baptism. We hope to clarify that for you. Uh, this step of obedience is vital and crucial. And uh, we look forward to sharing stories of how God's used this in our own lives. And so, Martin, why don't you kick us off today? Tell us your story. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it is a cool story. But before I get there, I've got to point out the fact that both John Williams and I were thinking the exact same thing. We're like, wear the baptism mm -hmm. shirt to the baptism podcast because we have a video podcast. And that's really cool. Yeah. Um, and me and John don't dress alike often. No. Um, maybe a little bit of a generational divide there on uh, yeah. clothing, but uh, we pulled it off. Um, mm. But yeah, as you look at even the pictures on the wall, uh, there's people wearing the same shirt. And uh, yeah, I, I'm always hopeful that those shirts get worn after baptism. Yeah. Because I think baptism is more than uh, the day in the water. Yeah. But um, all that said, you asked a question. You want to know about my baptism story. The first thing I'll say is my picture of the baptism uh, that I was in. I actually do have a photograph of it. They did exist when I was baptized uh, because it was a little later in life for me. Um, it is not on the wall, however, because that day at uh, Millennium Park in Grand Rapids, uh, there was an audience. And um, I was 20 something years old. Mm. Um, and kind of an idiot, uh, if I'm honest. I was literally just, just out of my salvation story, like just trying to sort out this idea of Jesus and who he was. But I knew he was calling me. I knew he was working. And baptism seemed like such an obvious next step. Uh, but I talked to the pastor. And he's like, yeah, show up. I was like, all right. So like, what do you, what do you wear to baptism? He's like, some swim trunks and a t-shirt. So I did. Um, but like I was not a college guy and didn't know better, I wore a white t-shirt. And back then I had abs and the, t the picture that I hang in my wall, kind of in an obscure location, cause it is kind of tooly, um, has this picture <laughs> of just me sopping wet with like my abs. It, it's hilarious to see. Um, I also had a full head of hair back then. As well. But uh, you did reference the abs as something that was, has, is kind of like in the Past. past, yeah. Is it? There are definitely at least two less distinct abs that exist <laughs> these days. Um, that's good. I'm fighting it, but yeah, that, that's a losing battle. Uh -huh. um, but no, uh, what, what's cool about my baptism story is because because I came to Christ later in life, and, and I've got a changed life story out there, so I'm not going to bore us all with the, the history of it. Um, we're at a little church in Grand Rapids. It was a Calvary Chapel, um, if you're familiar with that movement. Uh, Jesus Revolution came out mm -hmm. this year. Some more people actually know about it. Um, but my pastor, Tom Howe, at the time, uh, was a great dude and uh, just a, a righteous, genuine, caring man. Um, but I was we were driving there from my where I went to college in Big Rapids, so he only knew me a little bit, right? And I, I'm going and meeting my girlfriend at the time, um, and we're going to church together. And this is really the first church home I've got. Um, so he has no idea, like I'm signing up for baptism and it's a smaller church, but they, they did it in a very public place in Millennium Park and it's in the middle of summer and her whole family is showing up and I'm like, this is awesome. Like we're going to celebrate what God has done in my life. And like, I think I understood it fairly well, but I had no idea what the impact was going to be, nor the emotional, like everything that was going to happen that day in the water. So, mm -hmm. uh. Yeah, I, I signed up. I don't remember the process, but I, I remember getting to the park and being like, there's a lot of people here. Um, and there's only like five, I think, of us getting baptized. And the pastor, Tom, went out in the water and, and the other guy, I can't remember his name. He's a great dude. I apologize if you're out there and someday listen to the Tabernacle podcast, but um, they're out there. And uh, as people start getting called in, I just remember this like flush of emotion. I'm not a real emotional dude and I don't actually deal real well with it. Mm. So as it's hitting me, I'm like, wait a minute, 
like my faith isn't all emotional, but, but why? Well, this is powerful. Okay, I've already accepted Christ. Like this is, and I'm I'm trying to theology myself into the water and just like let go of it. And at some point, it just I think as soon as my foot hit the water, it just kind of all washed. Mm. And I'm just walking out to this thing like about to lose my mind because I realize this is a totally different direction in my life. Mm. Prior to this, and and still probably at this point, I. Um, I had just proposed to Cassie. Uh, we had talked to uh, this pastor about marrying us. He had called us out on sin in our life, and I'm tr- we're trying to pivot on it. But I'm 20 minutes from being, you know, passed out drunk in a fraternity house, and now I'm about to be baptized. And this whole idea of washing away the sin is is just flooring me. Mm-hmm. And I walk out, and these guys like put their hands on my shoulders, which is not a common thing, right? Like two other men grabbing you and you're about to let them control whether or not you get to breathe or not. <laughs> um, sounds familiar these days. And as they do, I just, I remember looking back at everybody and the part that, the part that's really cool to me is my mom was there. <clears throat> oh, my mom and I's relationship has been difficult and that was not a great time in her or I's life. <clears throat> but she was there and I honestly can't even remember why, why <clears throat> she made it for that. But she was, uh, at Millennium Park, she, she didn't have a license. I don't even know how she got there, but she's standing on the beach and she sees this and they put me under and I come back up and I'm just as excited and being, I'm kind of like half like staggering out of the water and Cassie gives me a big hug and her whole family's there and her dad's like this kind of tough, like I, I know the Lord and you better know your King James Version, Lord. And uh, I just remember him shaking my hand and giving me a hug and like the tears amidst the family and all her little brothers who are now six foot two and much bigger brothers than me. Mm are there and they're congratulating me and there's a big family picture and and my mom looks at me and she goes I want to do that mm-hmm. and I went right back to the theology wait is this right yeah. mm-hmm. should she just because I my mom has been known to as many mothers do trying to kind of like people please she just mm-hmm. I want you to be proud of me son is what's going through my head and I just look at her and realize, like, at some point, I'm like, who am I to question this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I remember the Ethiopian and, they, hey, there's some water. Shouldn't I do this thing? And I'm mm-hmm. like, I get out of the way. And then Pastor Tom calls me out into the water. And I get to stand there and baptize my mom. Mm-hmm. And that opened up a million conversations. I wish I could tell you that. And then the story was happily ever after in every way. But uh, being able to see her baptized, to have the picture on the wall next to me and mm. and realize the reality of the importance of baptism as a testimony mm-hmm. is it's so deeply personal to me because mm-hmm. yeah. I got to see her. And, and to this day, that's still one of the most beautiful moments in my life. And uh, Wow, that's quite a story. It's so good. Yeah. So There's good. A, a couple of things I, I think even in the, um, there is a massive difference and change that happens in that step of obedience. Mm-hmm. When I say, hey, God, yes, you have changed my heart. The heart change has happened. I've given my life to you. I believe in you for eternal life. Now, let me profess that publicly through baptism. Um, there's a really cool part of your story when you walk back and, and are greeted by Cassie's dad, like, you know, as a father, even thinking futuristically to handing my daughter over to some dude, um, I want to know that there's that public profession of his faith and that's the desire. That's the direction. That's tr- the trajectory because I know what that brings to a home and to family and to life. Right. Uh, so I can see even him watching this and going, okay. Like, not only is Martin um, someone who loves my daughter dearly, but now he is identifying as one who loves Jesus Christ dearly and mm. is growing in that relationship. Um, and said it publicly, so and I can hold him to it. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. right. Uh, that's good, man. Uh, I I had never heard the, the part about uh, your mom getting baptized, no, too. that's so. cool. Yeah, awesome. How about you, John Williams? Uh, well, I'm one of those uh, that's been dunked twice. <laughs> Uh, when I was a kid, obviously six, seven years old, everybody was getting baptized, so I got baptized. Before uh, photos, right? Uh, yeah, they didn't even have film back then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, then after I really gave my life to Christ as a teenager, 
I was baptized again because it meant something and I knew what I was doing at that point, you know, and I remember my mom and dad were there and everybody's there. Uh, Morrison Lake over in by Clarksville mm. is where we got dunked at. And, uh, it was, it was just a lot of fun and enjoyable time. And, uh, I'll never forget because back then we always sang in between people getting dunked, you know, getting baptized. And the song that everybody always sang in between was, I have decided to follow mm. Jesus. That's a shirt we have on today. And no, Martin is not my son because we don't <laughs> dress alike all the time. But, yeah. uh, uh, but being baptized and following Christ in baptism just following and saying, okay, this is what I have to do. I have to declare it publicly. And uh, lots of people there, you know, a uh, small church, but lots of people there, a lot of people that uh, remembered when I was baptized the first time, and I'm sure they were scratching their heads. <laughs> Wasn't he baptized one time? Yeah, but it didn't mean anything. <laughs> but the second time what was meaningful. And that's when I really decided to follow Christ was after that. Yeah. So good. Do you, do you remember why, like what clicked? So there's this, I was telling you guys earlier, I was talking to my daughter this morning about the idea of baptism mm -hmm. and like, Hey, what do you, what do you think should be said on this? She's 13. She's a great reference point, but mm -hmm. she was just pointing out how important it was to help people under young people, especially and parents that are helping their kids through it, understand like, how do you how do you decide and a lot of and it's a very common thing right to be baptized more right. than once yeah. and i don't i'm just gonna say i don't think there's anything mm -hmm. necessarily wrong with it mm -hmm. but between the age of six and when you chose to be baptized again yeah how did you know that you needed to again uh well one is i knew i wasn't a christian the first time i did it oh, okay uh and the second time i was and i talked to the pastor too uh you know, and my life stories out there also on a podcast. And um, I didn't get saved till late teens. And um, I talked to the pastor about it. I says, well, you know, I've already been baptized once. Should I do it again? And he just looked at me and he says, what do you think? And I said, well, it did not mean anything then. And he says, let's do it. And that's what clicked. But it was a prompting by by the Holy Spirit to do it. Yeah. It was, you know, it wasn't just an idea. All of a sudden I was realizing, reading scripture and realizing that I wasn't saved the first time. So how can you decide to follow Jesus and you're not saved? Yeah. You know, and then later on I actually meant it. Yeah, so good. Yeah. I love that uh, even with the potential of being afraid of what people think mm -hmm. in that moment, you were still determined to get baptized yeah. because it meant something to you yeah. in your heart. It's good. Yeah. Um, my story uh, is very similar, except my baptism happened when I was five years old. And so I'm saved early, mm -hmm. um, very clearly convicted of sin. And uh, I can remember sitting in First Baptist Church, Covington, Indiana, um, a revival service that went um, several nights in a row or weeks in a row, but the uh, each night I would petition my parents like, hey, I, I need to get saved. According to what he said, I'm a sinner and I need to get mm -hmm. saved, um, but I'm so young that they're like, you know, yeah, that's true, but do you truly understand it? And, and I keep pressing and pushing and finally uh, come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Um, and, and I... I already knew in my heart what I believed and what was wrong. Do I have all the theology settled at three, four years old? No, obviously not. Um, but um, when my mom led me to the Lord, we um, it was not but just a few months after that that they were having a baptismal service. And I'm like, well, I need to get baptized. Mm -hmm. And I look back at that space. It was this... Um, tongue and groove, pine stained dark <laughs> facade around the <laughs> baptismal tank. And um, my dad baptized me and he asked me basic questions. Like, have you given your life to Christ? And I'm so mortified 
of all these people watching that I don't say a word. And then he asked me another question. I don't say anything. And so he's reiterating what I've told him. Um, but I look back at that and I've thought several times, you know, was that a public profession of my faith? Probably not. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes, I declared that I wanted to be baptized. And so yeah. there's like a, kind of a, a, a pseudo baptism that's happening there where dad's speaking what I've proclaimed to him and letting people know that. Um, but it came later, uh, it came up again later in uh, one of my own children's lives. They were baptized early and um, truly had an understanding to a deeper level. Not that they got saved later, but like now I really understand what baptism is. Mm -hmm. Is it okay if I get baptized again? And I wrestled with yeah. that, just like uh, John would have wrestled. Yeah. And um, I'm like, absolutely. I want this to be a public profession of your faith, not mm -hmm. of something that, that we've um, led you to or directed you to, um, but a testimony of your faith. And when... Uh, they were baptized. It was just a, such a cool experience all the way around. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's that's my baptismal story. Wow. Well, that that seems like that was the beginning of your baptismal story. What yeah. I hear is this year might be the year. Yeah. To make the <laughs> yeah. public profession. <laughs> good. Like, I feel like I've made a pretty public profession since then. I mean, yeah. Getting there, but <laughs> but uh, I, I'm excited yeah. to be able to baptize. Yeah. Yeah, Matt, Matt might have to help me just yeah, for height reasons. That's but, good. That's mm -hmm. good. Oh, that's awesome. really cool. Yeah. And, you know, as, as we sit here and we talk about, like, our stories of, of baptism, it is, it, the two things that really stick out to me is, one, it is a public profession. It, it impacts other people. And, like, every now and again, I'll have a student that'll be like, you know, I'm just nervous to be in front of people. Can we just do it with, like, you know, just me and a couple of people? I'm like, I'm not going to tell you no, mm. but I'm going to ask you to go home and consider this. Mm. Uh, so during quarantine, we did baptism very different here at the tabernacle we took uh people down and we had a friend at the beach that we could do it and it was just their family mm -hmm. and um and don't get me wrong god moved in some really cool ways there because we would go and uh and i'm thinking of one in particular we'd go down there and their families felt much more comfortable families that wouldn't have come to a 200 person baptism on the beach at wilson's house you know the wilson's house um but they show up and then aunts and uncles that I can't believe that they even came and all those yeah. types of things. Yeah. It's cool, but the public piece of it, it kind of links to the other piece that dawned on me. It was it's so personal. Mm. You can make a profession of faith. You can be led to the Lord. Like we talk about the word saved and every now and again, I'm like, there's somebody out there going, what does saved mean, bro? Yeah. Um, it means that you have chosen to, to follow Christ um, and that you understand that you're going to follow him. But this piece of baptism is, I get to do something physical. Mm -hmm. I get to tactile, dip in the water, and there's, you know, we'll get into it a little bit more, but it's so personal. And the idea of it, you just, you can't be separate from it. Like, I can have a thought, I can say something out loud, and I can kind of, like, distance from it. It can be compartmentalized. Mm. I don't know about you. I couldn't do that when I was getting put in the water. Mm -hmm. It was it was wild. Yeah. yeah. It's good. It, it brings, what I was thinking about this is, uh, was the what is the proper age? <laughs> oh yeah, to get baptized. I mean, you know, you, you think about it, and I know with our kids, I'd really grill them because I wanted them to know for sure. I didn't want to have to baptize them twice, mm -hmm. and uh, I just made sure that they knew that they knew that they knew what this was. And you know, and I know we have kids come up to us. Hey, I want to get baptized. Ooh, you know, and you say, uh, let's talk to mom and dad and let's, let's see where you're at. And, you know, and that's always a hard thing. Yeah. Um, cause some of them don't have believing parents and now yeah. you're in a, a tough situation of, do we, do you disobey? You know, I had one student that was like, my parents said no. And I was like, then it's no Yeah. for the moment. Like, don't get me wrong. Like they're, they're then kicked yeah. in a whole nother process, but it's so hard because every parent asks themselves the question, is yeah. my child ready? Yeah. Every child is trying to sort that out. And like right. Mira said, but like Ziano, um, that's my son, Ziano. Mm -hmm. uh, he's getting baptized this year. God willing, you know, as, as we look forward, I'm yeah. super excited about this idea. But his sister has had such a huge impact in his life. 
on encouraging him like, hey, but are you sure? Like, mm. I know you want to go swimming. I know this is the quickest way into the water. I know like, and she's shared her testimony through that with him. And so he's sorting it out. But I've really resigned myself. Former youth pastor, you know, pastor of a church. I don't know what the proper age is. Yeah, there is none. I don't know <laughs> your kid. I don't know. And, and I don't think it's like the right answer to the right question, right? Because right. Mira, she can answer the right answer to any question. So can Z. Um, but he was going to be baptized last year and he decided totally of his own volition. Mm. I think I'm going to wait, dad. Mm. Now I am 100% certain and so is he that he knows the Lord. Yeah. But he really wanted to feel comfortable that he understood why he was making this particular step mm -hmm. and not just intellectually. So it was cool. It's cool watching that process and I'm grateful for it mm. because I learned more about that from them than I did about any theology, understanding, reading, anything else. Um, but there is scripture that, that makes this really challenging, right? Yeah. When was Jesus baptized? 30 Anybody years guess? old. About 30. Mm -hmm. So is that the proper age? Like 10 year olds, terrible idea. I don't, I don't know. I no. don't think we follow yeah. him. I think the, the beauty of what we have in scripture is we have a clarity that a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ is the uh, uh, pre-required response to baptism. Mm -hmm. And so like, um, oftentimes we'll be doing a, maybe a membership interview or we'll talk about baptism in a membership setting. Mm -hmm. And, um, I can remember one specific situation where a person was terrified to get baptized because they had been raised in a, a family that was of a faith that infant baptism was a massive part of that faith. Mm -hmm. And they believed both parents are deceased. They believed that being baptized now that they understood salvation was also dishonoring to something of the parents. And so you, there's this uh, wrestling that's happening. And yet infant baptism would be specifically that infant being baptism baptized into a parent's faith with a hope of future decisions to walk in Christ and walk according to mm -hmm. uh, the word but has nothing to do with that child's faith. Obviously, as an infant, they're not making conscientious decisions about sin and death and, and um, being right and restoring relationship with God. So um, there's that wrestling that happens there. Now, I have incredibly close friends that still teach and preach ba infant baptism. I biblically disagree. This is not me attempting to start a fight with anyone over that. Yeah. What I do see clear in Scripture is that repentance is an as absolute aspect that pre, um, what's the word that I'm looking for there? Preempts. Preempts, thank you. Yeah. Um, there was uh, a lot of things that were in my mind, none of them were correct, so thank you, that, <laughs> yeah. that preempts that <laughs> baptism decision. And so when uh, I make a conscience decision to trust Christ, the obedience then that is God is calling me to throughout scripture, we can look, we'll look at scripture here in a few, few moments, is then to follow him in obedience in that step of baptism. Um, you referenced uh, a couple minutes ago this idea of salvation. We, um, uh, I was a part of a high school staff at a large Christian school for a period of time where I was the spiritual life director. And so chapels and apologetics classes and all the different things were uh, in my uh, purview. And I would... Um, also be often counseling students. Um, they had school counselors, but there would be the biblical counseling aspect of it that mm -hmm. students would come and meet with me. And so one uh, student comes in and sits down and, and there was a very strong presence of, of the baptismal regeneration crowd there mm -hmm. and present in that school. And so believing that the only way to be saved is through baptism. So I, in just normal process until a person's given their heart to Christ and the word of God becomes this foundational aspect of their life, it's really hard to biblically counsel. So here, I want you to do this. You don't have a relationship with God that empowers you through the Holy Spirit to actually be able to walk and be obedient to this, but try this anyway. Um, and so we begin with the gospel. And so I'd simply ask the kid, hey man, um, are, you, are you saved? And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, 
how do you know you're saved? Well, I was baptized. Well, what's it mean to be mm. saved? And he said, well, I, um, I live in an affluent neighborhood and I have anything that I need. And, and he goes in this whole thing and he, he even states um, that he has avoided third world poverty. And so I said, so that's what salvation is. Yeah, that's what I was saved from. Mm. And so I... I'm completely awestruck. <laughs> right yeah. Now, like, yeah. Uh, yes. we'll shake it off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where, where do we go from here? Um, we, I illust- I pointed out some things about what true genuine salvation is. And then I finished reeling, scheduled second appointment, talked to a couple of people and they're like, well, maybe the word salvation or being saved is something that's just really f- new to him. And he, he was confused. And so, uh, stated this way, and I don't remember the exact way that I stated it, but it was something to the effect of what are you trusting in for eternity? How mm-hmm. do you know that you're going to go to heaven and why? And he said, because of baptism. Well, what does baptism mean? Well, it's, it's just me, it, like the water washed my sins away. No, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Christ and the blood that was shed on the cross paid the penalty for those sins being saved from something is first recognized that I'm lost. Mm-hmm. I have no hope apart from the finished work of Christ. Mm-hmm. And Christ on the cross pays a debt I can't pay. I'm accepting that debt or that payment of that debt as the way that I am now saved from my own personal sin and acknowledging that Christ did that on my behalf. That's salvation. Well, by the time the kid leaves the office, you know, he's like, I need to get saved then. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is often confusion because we do have these Christianese words. We, mm-hmm. um, as uh, Pastor John always says, we come from the Christian ghetto. We know the, the terminology, but the world doesn't know the terminology. Most people don't know the terminology. And so I think it's really important to mm-hmm. be clear that what God's word teaches is that there is a, uh, an understanding of sin, a need to be saved from that sin, and that I can't do it myself. Insert Christ. Christ paid that penalty and I'm Mm -hmm. accepting that finished work on the cross. And then my first step of obedience out of that salvation is then to profess publicly that I am a child of God. Right. Um, He was making, he was making baptism, his Christ, a very literal washing of it, which is the exact opposite of what scripture says. Water itself cannot wash the sin away. However, it is a representation of the decision you made by Christ's blood to have that sin washed away. Absolutely. And there's this difficulty in processing through this because the other side of it is I I find that the church then makes baptism almost optional. Like Mm -hmm. this like very like, yeah, you know, it's not about salvation. Well, here's the deal. Christ is salvation. Everything else in scripture is also not optional. We were commanded to go and make disciples, right? We'll go through all the passages of scripture and maybe we should actually hit a couple, but go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is a piece that is ordered. It is commanded. It is not optional. Does it determine your salvation? No. No. But that doesn't mean it's optional. And somewhere in there, we get really confused. And we do this with a lot of things in faith, I believe, because we're so worried that people will misunderstand because that's... That's a one in a hundred, you know, story where the kid's actually so baffled by this idea of salvation and baptism that he gets the two confused and, you know, he goes home from school one day and the spiritual counselor director has ruined his life and mom and dad are really upset because they're like, wait, I thought our kid was saved. And I'm sure you got some phone calls. I did have some follow-up. I was going to say that that would be interesting (laughs) phone calls after that. Yeah. Um, But like, good. Jump in the comment section, guys. Like, let's have a conversation. This is important stuff to be able to sort through so that we are clearly communicating this. Yeah. So that our young people grow up to be well-rooted and founded in understanding of the difference between salvation, justification, sanctification, baptism, all these pieces and parts. Um, And Here's the deal. You don't have to get the get it right on a test. You're just sorting through it so that you're you're understanding God's process in our life. Um, mm-hmm. And when we do, we start looking at baptism as I, the way I believe it is. It's a beautiful physical representation uh, of what we have already inwardly chosen. Right. And it becomes a signpost. Like, yeah, I'm planting my flag here. Mm-hmm. Everybody has seen me do this. Like mm-hmm. Martin, the fraternity idiot's gotta gotta look a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. and, and it's uh, public accountability. There's a bunch there, but yeah, it's good. Yeah. And it's why often uh, churches would require the uh, baptism 
component for membership. Member, yeah. Right. It there's a representation piece that's there. Mm -hmm. I, as you said, put my signpost. Community's watching. Yeah. I'm publicly testifying that I want to be not only a part of the family of God, but of this church family as we grow in our faith. Uh, this is a public testimony of what God's doing in my heart. Right. Mm -hmm. It's really good. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> and I know we don't require that here as membership. Right. To be baptized. And coming from the Baptist background, that threw me a curve when I first came. And I'm thinking, what? You know? But it, it is an act of obedience. And I think, you know, we're saved by grace alone, not by works. Same thing. You know, sometimes we tie those two together. Baptism does not save us. Right. And I like what you said. It's an inward outward expression of something that happened inward and we are planning our stake this is where i changed my life this is where i am now following christ and i want the world to know and you know baptism is is a sign of that yeah. well and that's why i have so much respect for you for uh, there are other prominent families within our church i'm going to choose to leave that out because uh, mm -hmm. they get to make that proclamation but i think they did clearly um, where their children have been rebaptized mm -hmm. in this church. Um, and it's like, I can respect that because for them, they began to understand this reality. Hey, this wasn't what I see scripture calling me to be. Okay. I know where my heart was. I know where my heart is. There is a difference. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was an intellectual understanding. Maybe it was a, you know, Holy Spirit connection. Right. Maybe who knows, but Hey, here's my flag. Mm -hmm. I don't see any problem with multiple flags in there. Now, here's an important question. How many times is reasonable, however? Because I do know that we got at yeah. least one kid that pretty much every summer gets yeah. baptized. And I'm always lucky, like happy to dunk him. But every year I hold him down a little bit longer yeah. in hopes <laughs> this one will stick. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think as the, um, when we look at scripture, the intent is that there is a single profession of faith in a single time that you follow that step of obedience for public profession. Mm -hmm. um, where I, having been in student ministry for forever, there will be students that you see make a conscientious decision to follow Christ in a, stu in a worship night or a mm -hmm. student ministry night. And then four months later, you're at camp and a great message is preached on the gospel and they yeah. respond to the gospel. Now the uh, fleshly side of me is like, no, you idiot. I already led you. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. and now there's a, a piece of that that's frustrating because it's like, man, I thought, I thought this was real. Right. Um, yet the reality is if that child, that student has questioned their faith and they are not sure, and it's not just a, something that they need a reassurance or an assurity of faith, mm. but they're like, man, I really don't think that was real in my life. Well, then let's get saved. Right. Like, let's walk you through those steps again. Um, but as it relates to baptism, there can be, uh, especially, you know, we're, we're blessed at the tabernacle to have large baptisms with lots mm -hmm. of people. And so there can be just an excitement generated of, ooh, here's a, a spot where I get all eyes on me and so, an attention mm -hmm. piece. So we have to be super careful uh, of the motives. But again, like... I don't get to be the judge of the motive of the heart. Right. No. Um, right. And, and I certainly right. don't want to limit something that God's going to yeah. be doing. I need to go back to something that, you know, was, I said is, you know, here at the tab, you don't have to be baptized to be a member. Right. And how I sorted that out in my brain was, yeah, let's be a member. Let's grow. Let's be part of this under the teaching Eventually, hopefully, they'll get to where, oh, I need to be baptized. Yeah. And it isn't a thing where, okay, I'm saved. Oh, I want to become a member, so I want to get baptized so I can become a member. Not because— It can't be a— It, it can't—you know, it's, it's it, a public testimony. It, it's order of operations, right? Yes. The membership piece, and, and I totally respect churches that choose to say that because yeah. it's a— I want to make sure that you're saved, and this seems mm -hmm. to be a good indicator of it. It's right. like, okay, cool, that, that's fine too. 
But I like what you said. I don't want it to be bait for a mistaken understanding of what baptism is. Right. And I also like the idea that as we think through it, and like you said, as I sit under the teaching of, as I begin to understand the piece of, and we'll do this on a membership pod or conversation someday, mm-hmm. but the only reason I see for membership, I'm probably going to get smacked for this one. Probably. But the only reason I see for membership is choosing to sit under the authority of a church accountability mm-hmm. to yes. your church. It's basically saying, hey, um, yeah, I'm around here. I like the sermons, I, I whatever, like all the kind of superficial things. Mm-hmm. But at some point you have to say, hey, I'm going to choose to be a member because I want to be accountable to this church. And when my life goes off the rails, I want you guys to have permission to step into my life. Mm. And in that space, yeah. now all of a sudden, the idea of baptism, like sit, being accountable to others, now you're in a fight club. Mm-hmm. Bro looks at you and is like, you ain't baptized? What are you waiting? You know, all of a sudden we get back to the Ethiopian. It's like, what are you waiting for? Yeah. Uh, I think it's in First Peter, there's that piece yep. where it's like, yep. hey, now, let's not wait on this. We, right. Um, but so biblically, I just want to give a couple of scriptures here. When we talk about baptism cannot be a necessity for mm-hmm. salvation. Right. We'll go back to the common thief on the cross. Right. Mm-hmm. He was up there, pretty sure he didn't get baptized. I don't think Jesus spit in his eye. Like yep. we don't see any of that. But he said, You will be with me in paradise. Mm-hmm. So there is a reality of salvation apart from. Mm-hmm. Now, let's not use that as the excuse not to get baptized. Let's understand that God is a God that can work through many ways. Mm-hmm. He gives us clear direction. And in the midst of the circumstances where you happen to be being crucified, yeah, you don't have to be baptized. Mm-hmm. Everybody else probably should try to do that thing I don't yeah know. That's, yeah. My, that's my thought there it's good um i think first peter three twenty one is often um referenced as a baptism for salvation it yeah. says um baptism now saves you and then peter goes on to say not as a removal of dirt from the body but as an appeal to god for a good conscience through the resurrection of jesus christ mm-hmm and so he's not referring to baptism as having this uh, salvific power that transforms you, but instead it's referencing the fact that uh, salvation is, uh, it, this, the baptism is an instrument uh, that is connecting the believer to Christ from this, the perspective that when we think of salvation, it is invisible from the standpoint that I can say that I came mm-hmm. to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you can't see this transformation happening inside of my heart. Right. But baptism is being is this public, uh, non-invisible representation of what God has done in my heart. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we see even in uh, uh, Romans 6, 3 through 4, uh, it says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death Mm -hmm. in order that just as Jesus Christ walked from the dead or was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so some will debate while sprinkling and being dunked and all of the imagery that it's given in Scripture is this representation of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, I go to baptize someone, I say, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in baptism, Mm -hmm. raised to walk in newness of life. And these aren't just like coined uh, Baptist terms. Right. right. These are straight from scripture. Yeah. And there's a representation. There's a newness of life that is being represented. There's a change in the walk because now this is that public testimony of what uh, has been invisible uh, mm-hmm. to others, not to me, but to others right. uh, up to that point in my life. Right. Well, exactly. And even in that passage, so if you go back to 18, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteousness for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, right? That he might bring us to God, mm-hmm. being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patient waits in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight people, were brought safely through water, mm-hmm. baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you couldn't be more clear about that's sandwiched in to, it was Christ that brings you to God. Mm -hmm. It is through Christ that baptism has any power at all. 
But it also is, this is in correspondence to what happened for Noah. So for the brand new believer out there, Noah was not a happy children's tale. Noah was actually the story of the entire earth being wiped out and cleansed from unrighteousness Mm -hmm. by water and God saving eight people to himself as an inheritance. When we look at baptism in that light, corresponding to that, we begin to understand that it's not about the water. God said he'd never use that again, but he's coming back. He's going to use something else. Fire, I believe, is kind of how it lays out. Yeah. But he clearly explains this is a representation. It's an understanding. It's sim- symbolic is a little bit light, I think, of a term for it. And I think we use that oftentimes. But this is to point us to the understanding. God is so kind and so gracious with us to constantly go back. And he's like, all right, let me give you another picture of this, guys. Mm -hmm. I know you're struggling to understand it, the sprinkle, the dunk, the this, the that, the other thing. But let me explain it to you. Water cleanses the entire earth. It's like that. It corresponds to that, he says. And then we're like, wait, no, it says it saves. No, guys, don't do that. So I I got a question at the end of all that, though, um, because you mentioned the sprinkling and the dunking. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. I think scripture is really clear. Mm -hmm. Immersion is the standard we see. We had a, a woman last year. Um, yeah, I was going to bring that up. Yeah. yeah. And it was such a cool experience. Um, she had just come out of surgery. She could not be in the water. Mm-hmm. Um, so we sprinkled her. Yeah. And uh, I got to tell you, it was amazing to me, as beautiful yeah. a moment as it was, that I had to answer questions immediately they're following. It's like, well, she's not actually baptized. I was like, she would have immediately gone septic had I taken her in that water. I want her to meet Jesus, just not like that. Yeah. What, yeah. So, I, what right. do you? How do you feel about that? Whatever. Well, I, because <clears throat> when we first talked about doing that, you know, my old theology started <laughs> creeping up on me. But then I thought, no, she is publicly professing Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Now, whether you're dunked or sprinkled at that point, I mean, yeah, we want to dunk them. I understand the, the. Uh, that theory, that yeah. that theology, but I, this was a completely different thing. In her mind, she's baptized. Yeah. In my mind, she's baptized yeah. because she did make a public profession of faith. She knows where she stands. Well, and and we said death, burial, and resurrection. We yeah. we again corresponded to, pointed to the reality yeah. of Christ's death, burial, yeah. and resurrection for this. I, and I'm gonna say. If we want to get literal about this, do we dig a hole? Like, come on, guys. At what point do we accept the fact that God is a God that is beyond our construct? Mm -hmm. And we don't have to pigeonhole. Now, I do think that there are things in Scripture where you don't get to toy around. It is absolutely 100% clear. But if he left room for the thief on the cross, then he left room for Susan. And the beauty of, I mean, she looked up and she saw the water come on her face. And it was just, it was one of the coolest moments um, as she wasn't alone. Her family was there. Her family right. was, if I remember correctly, uh, her daughter's mm-hmm. in law, like the whole family's there as a part right. of this baptism, being baptized together. It's like, ah. Yeah, I, th- I think the uh, it makes perfect sense. Obviously, Scripture tells us what baptism is with immersion. Mm-hmm. And so we honor that. We follow that in those scenarios of mm-hmm. also um, sprinkled, water right. on a man in the hospital bed that's, right. that's not coming out of that hospital bed, right. but's made a profession of faith, wants to be right. obedient to Christ in, in right. baptism. And uh, so we d- did the very closest thing we could do to that, and that's yeah. uh, uh, sprinkling water. See, I, I, <laughs> they knew what they were doing. Right. They were following Christ, although physically they couldn't do it. Whereas a baby, they have no choice. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah, like I can't go down the difference. I can't yeah. go down the sidewalk splashing people and being like you're baptized. Yeah, I baptized 132 people today in Traverse City. <laughs> yeah, none of them knew it, but yeah, got punched a few times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. Uh, so, I, all right, let me ask the question. We've talked a lot about what baptism is, and we've talked a little bit about what baptism is not. Um, mm-hmm. In the fact that it, it is not what saves you, it is the the corresponding piece that we do as representation that saves us. Um, I, I'm curious, because you mentioned earlier this idea of the emotional draw to it, right? This mm-hmm. big day. 
What are some of the big mistakes we make that surround baptism? Not necessarily theologically, but how we do it. And I'll, I'll give one as a context um, because I think that, you know, we, we say a lot of times that, uh, you know, sprinkle, super soak or whatever. And we, we say these things. And I like that Adam Ray's a little bit more firm on. He's like, no, they're pretty straightforward. This is the answer. But yeah. I, I give that God can move outside of that. Um, but one that I think that is, is always difficult is we do this baptism service. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at the tab, we go to a local lake. Pretty much any campus is going to find a lake. We're going to take you down there. We're going to do the thing. Uh, there are going to be cheers. Um, for, you know, some years when we've had a smaller crew, we kind of gave them a chance to give a verse or a testimony or something in there. We wanted to know that their profession was there. We take them aside. We walk them through this idea of what it is, walk them through how we're going to hold our hands and not get no- water up our nose. We try to do those things. But tomorrow comes. Right, You were there, you were cheered on, and tomorrow comes. And for a lot of years, I felt like tomorrow is a hard day. Mm -hmm. The cheers are gone. I've done the obedience thing. I know what I'm doing, but now I'm living life alone and oftentimes very separate from this day of cheers. It's almost, and in some churches, I will say in my past, I saw baptism, and then the next day it's like, well, you're still sinning. And it, it's this massive disconnect. Mm. And people tend to, tended to feel very lonely, lost. And mm-hmm. what I would see is this huge trough, right? Spiritual high to a huge valley. And uh, it was two years ago, three years ago, I, I was reading a, a Bible app plan that brought that up. And I was like, we got to do something about this. Mm-hmm. Like, we got to walk hand in hand as much as we can. And some people won't let you do that, right? They mm-hmm. get baptized and then they disappear. And it's like, we can't mm-hmm. do anything about that. But. Um, that's, that's always been a conviction of my heart. Um, so are there other things that we mess up or is there a way that we can do that better? Like, I'm just curious on, on thoughts there because every person that will get baptized this year, last year was a huge number. I mean, Manistee alone had 42. Mm -hmm. I remember the total number was close to 84. 84. Yep. 84 people got baptized last year. Um, who knows how many this year could be four, uh, but they will walk out and they will all have a tomorrow. Mm-hmm. They will all have a, a path that they're following to draw nearer to Christ. And yes, the church has things available. But anyways, yeah. What, what could we do better? How could we do that better? Are there other things that we could do in that picture? Uh, I grew up in a, a church environment where the, uh, some of the churches that we would be a part of, uh, not like my home and local church, but other churches at other events, they would maybe have a preacher that would preach specifically on the gospel, a very evangelistic outreach type service. And then immediately following, there would be an opportunity for people to be baptized. Mm -hmm. There's two sides to that. On the one hand, if those people truly put their faith and trust in Christ, sweet. I think there is a potential at times, and there's a potential of this in any, any aspect of our worship to have an emotional response or a uh, I'm responding because he responded or she Mm -hmm. responded to where uh, that is not a personal testimony of your faith experience, that there's a faith and repentance that's happened in your own heart and your own life. Um, So our church specifically said, hey, if you put your faith and trust in Christ, that's phenomenal. And then we would take them and say, if you're interested in being baptized, let's have a, let's have a meeting, Mm -hmm. sit down and take some time and talk through what baptism is, uh, clarify their salvation testimony. So, because we would often ask them to even share, like, how'd you come to know Christ? How's your life changed? Those types of things. Um, And it's also why I caution at student ministry events, specifically camps, because you'll see, Mm -hmm. um, hey, we had uh, 94 kids come forward tonight for salvation. Now, I am so excited when that happens. I'm not knocking that, but having watched students through the years, like I've already referenced, Mm -hmm. make multiple decisions, sometimes those decisions literally are because they're caught up in an emotional moment. Um, One thing happened, and not to shout out Britain, but uh, one thing I I greatly appreciated, we were at a, a youth event. He's speaking, come to the close, shares the gospel, um, music starts, and he turns around and says, hey. In this moment, I want it to be silent. I don't want anybody to respond because they're drawn in 
by anything other than the work of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Now, music is phenomenal. Worship is phenomenal. Worship yeah. has a place. Please don't hear me wrong. But we can, if we're not careful, create an atmosphere where a person can be led by emotion and not by the truth and the work <coughs> of the Holy Spirit. And that is what always concerns me when there's a, a giant, come on, let's get baptized moment. Um, leading up to baptism here, I believe it's vital that not only are we teaching on what baptism is, but we have time to personally uh, mm -hmm. reflect with that person about their salvation testimony and then say, if this is true in your life, we would love to see you be baptized if that's how God's leading you in this step of obedience. Um, that being said, we've had public baptisms where a person is unbeknownst to anyone else, literally listening to testimony after testimony after testimony and saying, I need to get saved. It's time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't remember the kid's name, but this happened recently. Um, he's sitting over there just hanging out at the beach and mm -hmm. hears testimony after testimony, comes and finds us. Um, and we sent him off with one of the leaders of the church who he then prayed and trusted Christ and came right down in the water, gave testimony of what had just happened, and we baptized him. <laughs> so uh, that's a, a beautiful experience. And, and again, um, we love at times to try to play God in that person's life or yeah. try to play the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm not going to, if the person is making a profession of faith, they, they're telling me that they're, they've saved, they're saved and they've put their faith in Christ. I'm not going to sit there and go, well, you know, yeah. I don't know. It's only been eight seconds. It's maybe real. Yeah. 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 So, so John, I know that, uh, like last year that was, that was you and I trying to connect with everybody in Buckley and, mm -hmm. you know, Seth and that crew over there trying mm -hmm. to connect with everybody in Masty. And it's daunting, right? 42 per campus or yeah. 40 people per campus. And you're trying to have a meaningful conversation rega in regards to baptism. Um, how, like, how have you done that? And how have you found that to be, um, most beneficial and i mean there's a mm -hmm. story or two along there um i'd be interested to hear it yeah um well one thing is you need to prepare them they once you walk through what baptism is and you explain it and you let them okay if this is where you're at do you want to be baptized you know is, is this still something you want to do yes okay then get ready because you're going to make a public profession and all of a sudden Satan's going to come in and just try to derail you. Wreak havoc. But because you've made this decision for Christ, it doesn't mean everybody has to be around all the time. Yeah. It means you get in the word in the morning or whenever it works for you. you. Every morning you get up and, Lord, this is your day. How can I serve you? And get them plugged in. <laughs> That's, that's the best way to, to keep up, you know, and we've all seen people that get baptized and you never see them again. Right. You know, but I'm not going to judge that. I, I'm not the judge. No, but I, it, I love that you said it that way because it puts the ownership of a continued walk with Christ right. where it belongs between them and God. Right. But it also emphasizes the community that's essential in it. Yeah. And you mentioned it, like the, the hardest. So uh, these pictures on the wall are, are friends of mine that I, I print out the people that I'm close to each year mm -hmm. and I, I get them. They cover my walls. It keeps me centered and focused on what matters most. But there are pictures on my walls that are really hard. Mm -hmm. That bro from Fight Club that was like all in, like super excited, baptized him, almost drowned doing it. And then, where are you, man? I haven't seen you in two years. And, and yeah. there's a tear at each one of those. Because the choice will always be ours. Mm -hmm. No matter what signpost we put up, no matter how many people we surround, no matter what the program is, no matter how many pastors call you afterward, you will choose to follow Christ or you will not. Yes. Isaac, I know you're out there going, that's not true. But, you know, even in a Calvinistic perspective, yeah. it seems as if there's at least one choice in there. And my favorite passage of scripture in this is in Acts chapter eight. It's the Ethiopian eunuch. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, Philip's walking down the road, sees this guy traveling in a carriage. He's reading the Bible, which is really right. interesting to me. And he runs up. He's like, hey, do you not understand what you're reading? He's like, how can I understand this? Nobody's ever taught me. Philip jumps in, shares the gospel with him, mm -hmm. right? Very much like the kid on the beach. It's just like, come here, let me, let me explain this to you. Walks him through it. 
And they're in the middle of the desert, but for whatever reason, they find themselves some water. And he's like, there's some water over there. Why should I not be baptized right now? Philip's yeah. like, let's do this. Yeah. And I've never caught this until John was just talking. And then he baptizes him in the water, commands his chariot to stop, and they came up to the water, the spirit of the Lord. And, and then when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more. Mm-hmm. God literally took him. He was like, no, nah, you got this eunuch. We don't even yeah. know the guy's name. He, yeah. But God takes Philip out of it. He wasn't then, I traveled the next three years with him training no. him in the gospel. No. At some point, that eunuch had to take control of his following of Jesus. He already had the Bible. Right, At which he did. Right. If, if you've, you follow history, there was an outbreak in Ethiopia, people coming to know Christ. And a lot of people think it was that eunuch. I love the word outbreak there. Yeah. It's like, there was a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of no, <laughs> we don't say that. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you're right. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly, he is sainted in, you know, at some level. Yeah. It, yeah well, let's say however, yeah. yeah. <laughs> however you want to do it. But yeah, like this dude, it, it, it is right. likely that he did not then turn away, walk away no. from his faith. Instead, what we see is God taking Philip out of the picture and him apparently being instrumental in the spread of the gospel. Yes. Yeah. And that is, those are the stories that hang mm-hmm. on my wall that I get excited about. The yeah. the um the young lady up just above John Williams there is one of those stories for me is as like super mm-hmm. shy, super timid young lady. Like the idea of being baptized in front of people was terrifying to her. Mm-hmm. And her arms are thrown in the air and the smile on her face mm-hmm. is priceless. And now she is absolutely invested in our Cadillac yeah. campus and helping ensure that the gospel is shared week to mm-hmm. week. And it's like, man, God, yeah, you do some cool things through yeah. some very, very unique humans. Yeah. Thanks for giving me a picture of that. Yeah. yeah so good. Yeah. I, mm. I love the, the perspective too. If we think very practically, when a person puts their faith and trust in Christ, they become your and my brother or sister. Mm-hmm. And that, community aspect of then this public profession i'm a child of god i'm also saying i'm your brother and your sister right and who here wants to allow a brother or sister to slide away yeah um if we have any love within our hearts at all none of us Mm -hmm. and there's that passion then to walk arm in arm side by side i think it's a vital aspect of our small group ministry through fight club tab women yeah it's 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 a crucial element yeah I, can I share a story of uh, yeah. yeah. uh, three years ago or four years ago when we were building uh, T2? There was one of the workers. That of, was seven years ago. John. Seven years ago. Holy Pardon smokes, me. it's forever ago, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. Whoa. But anyway, <laughs> one of the workers, he was a mason. He was there. Him and I struck up a conversation quite a few times. And, and then we'd always fix lunch for him on Wednesdays. And he would come down to my office when we were done, and we'd talk about Christ and, and stuff. <coughs> well, he got saved in my office, Amen. And which was just super cool. And But he lived up in Newberry, mm. right? So he'd go home for the weekends. But anyway, he'd come back uh, a few weeks later, and he, him and I were yakking, and he says, can I get baptized? And I well, yeah. I mean, let's let's talk about this. You really know what it is. And so we take him down to get you gumi and uh, John Vermilion and I baptize him and a lot of the staff was there and his son showed up, mm-hmm. you know, which was really cool be- and drove all the way from Newberry. And uh, then he went and they bought an old building up there and they started a church. Oh, wow. Incredible. Just- That's- uh, that's that story, right? Yeah. That, that's that's the story. He's the masonry. I'm not going to yeah. say eunuch. That's, you know, <laughs> yeah. No, he's not a eunuch. Yeah. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah. yeah. But that's great. That was one of the stories that I just, I really, you know, it's one of those that, hey, all right, cool. Yeah. So good. God's man. working. So good. Yeah. I, one, uh, this is a, um, a parallel conversation piece not necessarily related to baptism Mm -hmm. but uh as the construction workers are here john's looking for a witnessing opportunity through feeding them 
And this is like so close to my heart with mm. uh, just how I love to operate. And I think God's called us to operate. So two days ago, there's construction workers all around our building currently. Natural gas gassing yeah. it up. Yeah. Yep. And I uh, keep going out and ask them if they need water, need to use the restroom, whatever. Well, they're like, dude, um, another guy's already been out here and asked us that same question. And I'm like, oh, good. So the next day I stop, you guys need anything? And they're like, dude, two guys have already stopped and asked us if we need anything. <laughs> and then yesterday I find out John's out there making them lunch and grilling burgers for them. And, and uh, what a beautiful witnessing opportunity. Mm -hmm. Love your heart in that and your care for, for people. Um, that's quite possibly some of the first connections they've ever had with the church yeah. and their first connection is people caring for them and love yeah. them. So praise the Lord, man. And Good. just by providence, God's providence, one of the workers <laughs> didn't get told that it was food. So after everybody's cleared and gone, we picked up everything. This guy comes in, he says, Hey, I heard you had food here for us. I share, what do you want? You know, it's like get him a hot dog and chips. And, and then him and I just sit there and chit chat about stuff. I said, do you go to church anywhere? No, I haven't gone to church in a long time. I said, what happened? You know? And so we just got into that conversation about, Hey, you know, let's get back into church. And he lives down by Bay city and they have a little church that they used to go to, but they just haven't been there in years. And I said, get back in. Yeah. You know? Praise the Lord. Yeah. I thought that was the coolest thing. Cause I'm now mind you, Adam Ray's story was spot on two guys said hi to them, two guys. And I have my reasons. I'm not sharing that one on the podcast, but, um, it was interesting to me because I got to observe that conversation with you and that mm -hmm. gentleman. Cause he walked in really late. Like, yeah. he, like everybody's come in eating. There's 12 or more guys in yeah. the place. And then this dude walks in kind of sheepishly like, uh, any food left? John makes him feel totally at home. But then I, I walk out of the room and I come back, I don't know, probably half an hour later and you guys seem like best friends. <laughs> and I just think to myself, I'm like, this is a gift that God has given this man to be able to have those types of conversations. Mm -hmm. But there's also an, a, was an awareness of the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like he saw the opportunity and he took it. And I, I don't know, I'm going to use this to steer back to baptism, but you see people that from all different personality types, from all different ways of how they engage people. And there are opportunities for all of us to share the gospel. I, you know, I think sometimes we have this picture of, it's the guy with the microphone, it's, mm -hmm. you know, super evangelism guy. It's, I've got to walk into every place and find the, you know, the angle. Um, and sometimes it's just like, no, there are other humans in your presence. Mm -hmm. Start there. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself back, um, cause I, I would love it if the, all we did the rest of the podcast, just share stories about baptism. Cause they just, they make Adam Ray all misty eyed. Yeah. By the way, if you can't <laughs> see that on the podcast, you know, a dude cares about the gospel because any mm. story about salvation, he is immediately there. And, uh, mm. Um, I just don't have emotions. I'm dead inside. But, uh, <laughs> no heart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> two years ago. I actually, I'm going to screw that up because my wife will tell me how many years ago it actually was, but it might've been two years ago. Anything's possible. Yeah. Um, one of my good friends and her daughter uh, got baptized. And then last year, uh, the husband and the son got baptized. And they just, they wanted to do it that way, kind of as a direct thing. And it was really cool because anytime you've got a personal connection to the people in the water, it's just, it's impactful. It's important. But I, what I f had forgotten until I asked my wife this morning was that those two getting baptized was a connection point for an aunt who came to watch. Mm. And that aunt came to watch and comes from a different uh, tradition of, of faith. We'll put it that way. And she just, she's always been open to the conversation. And she's just a wonderful, amazing, really cool lady. But she came there and I remember her saying, there's something different about this. It didn't feel regimented and legalistic and like, I've got to do, do, do. And these are all the reasons why and how you do it. Like, this feels like a celebration. Mm. And I was like, well, it, it kind of is. I mean, look at all these people that are public. Like, and my wife got to have more of the conversation than I did, but she is consistently at our church and I don't care where she ends up. But the fact is, is that she is consistently seeking more and more of Christ, more and more of truth. And then as I watch the entirety of the family, it's just, there's been a beauty to it. And I am so grateful for, I say this all the time, and it's as true as the day is long. I'm just grateful for the vantage point that we get to see things like that. 
Because what I will tell you is, I wouldn't doubt that someday we get to see her baptized here. Mm. Yeah. And she is an extremely introverted human being, mm. but her testimony will be used in the life of somebody else. And mm. God does this beautiful math problem of multiplication mm. every time he does anything. It's like, wow. Yeah, mm. so good. Yeah. Um, two things, and uh, we can start to bring this to a close. Uh, um, it's amazing how fast an hour, hour goes. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, there was a student recently that uh, had given her life to Christ, modeled a uh, relationship with Christ to uh, a level that was um, starting to cause her family, parents specifically, to be uncomfortable. Not from the standpoint that they weren't excited for her, but from the standpoint that they were witnessing a child having a more Christ-like faith than they did mm. and came around to a time of baptism, a special Sunday set aside for it, and the dad reaches out to me and he goes, it's time I lead. And so... Mm. He was the first one in the take. Mm. Then mom then each of the kids. And it wasn't that there was just this big show that was happening or that this wasn't real to them, but he recognized that as his daughter wanted to get baptized, no, he had not been obedient himself in that and wanted to take the responsibility for what leadership in that home looked like. Wow. Spiritual leadership. Um, uh, really cool too, because it, it developed a, a phenomenal friendship there as well. Mm. Um, so I've gotten to witness the couple of years since that time as massive changes have happened there in their lives. And um, so thankful. Um, I did want to say when this podcast drops, it will be three days, four days before the um, part of first Kings chapter 21, where um, Ahab finally, and this is maybe just a touch of a spoiler, but he finally comes to a place of repentance Podcast mm. listeners deserve that. I, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this Sunday is in, we're in chapter 20, but the following Sunday in chapter 21, there's a place of repentance. So this is a um, opportunity in a, an Old Testament text to see mercy, grace, and repentance modeled. And so highly evangelistic in that weekend um, would just really encourage listeners to invite um as and we want you to invite every sunday this is not just some specific yeah, sunday right. but as you're as it relates specifically to the gospel and salvation um that will be a centerpiece of that weekend the gospel is present you'll hear it in every sermon that's preached here mm -hmm. um, because christ is in every piece of text uh, but just uh particularly emphasized that week i encourage you to invite and uh, we look forward to August 11th, 18th, and 25th at the mm -hmm. different campuses as we have an opportunity to see people baptized in obedience, that step of obedience to what yes. God has called them to. That's yeah. good. You even knew the dates offhand. Wow. Well that was, yeah. I knew the 18th because that's ours. Right. <laughs> I, I knew I, that they were in August. I knew, the, <laughs> I knew the 18th and I was doing the simple math of seven days before, seven oh, days after. Okay. So. <laughs> simple math. Yeah. There's no such thing. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, and I'll double down on that because even if you're not coming to the tabernacle, I suspect that if you invite somebody next week to church and your church is who knows where, uh, there will be a way that God can work through that. Just, Absolutely. Just a random guess on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Get after it. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, good. all right. I'm sorry. One more and I'll keep this one really brief, but when you say this idea of the, the connection points, the evangelistic message, um, I, I was immediately reminded of this couple that I'm, I'm currently getting to work with. They're just really cool and their testimony is amazing, but not mine to be able to share today. But what I think is really beautiful is it hinges upon their baptism last year as this connection point where they decided together. Now they're dating at this point, like they're just meeting and they come from a background that wasn't, you know, everybody's going to do all the right church things, but they choose in that moment, we're going to get baptized together. That's going to be the foundation. And then when they reach out of like, hey, we want to get married, it's a no brainer because they're like, hey, this connects directly to our baptism. And I'm like, you got, oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah. Like, I love that there's this connection point. Um, and then being able to see a, a marriage start foundationally there mm -hmm. 
I'm just sitting back with my hands behind me, just like this, this could work. This could go really, really well. And I'm Mm -hmm. excited 10 years from now to be on another podcast and be able to share how that comes to fruition. And I know it won't be perfect, but I promise you, having been in enough of those moments now, man, knew where you're starting. uh, And the story might begin next week in, you know, first Kings Mm -hmm. 21. So yeah, invite people, give people the opportunity. Gosh, our podcast listeners are some of the coolest people in the world because they actually sit through an hour and a half of our voices, um, picking and poking and hearing all the things. Mm. We don't get comment threads that are, well, what about, you know, it's, it's just an amazing community and what a cool opportunity to be able to use this. Send this to somebody, uh, share yeah. it on your social media. Like we talk about all those things all the time, but guys, this is how uh, conversation spreads. This is how the gospel spreads in 2024. Yeah, so good. Good. Love it. Hey, thank you so much, uh, podcast listeners. This is the Tabernacle Podcast with Martin Rizzi, John Williams, Matthew, Corey Hughes, Hughes, and Adam Ray. Thank you so much for listening today.